I want to say a word before I get into the text today. You know, when you see our children this morning, and, and um, Scripture is pretty clear that um, anyone who would cause one of these little ones to believe in him to go astray, that's a pretty dangerous place to be, pretty harsh. He says, better off to have a millstone tied to your neck and thrown into the sea. And it, it goes on to say that there, there are going to be stumbling blocks in our culture, but woe to him through whom the stumbling block comes. We're dealing with cultural issues. We're dealing with very divisive cultural issues in this series. And the one today is, is uh, particularly divisive. And, and I'll, I'll want to say a word specifically to our students that are here because this is something that they, they have coming at them all the time. The spirit of the message today is not directed toward um, any harshness toward people that are struggling with these issues. I want you to know that God loves you and cares about you. We love you and care about you. Here's the truth of the matter. For every one of us in this room, every one of us have issues. I have issues. My wife will tell you, I got lots of issues. The person sitting next to you has issues. The person on the other side of you has issues. And the person between them has issues too. We all have issues. But I want you to know that in Jesus Christ, we can find our true identity, who we, who we really are. And that's my prayer for all of us today. So as we look at this very controversial subject. So I want to show you, I want to begin by showing you a couple of slides. These are not slides produced by a Christian organization. They're made by Gallup, which is a very well-known organization. Look what Gallup says. Look at the first one. This is Americans' self-identification as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or something other than heterosexual. Now look, look at culture, what has happened in our culture. Back in 2012, 3.5% of the people on the far left side, you see it, identified as one of those categories. 2013, 3.6, and 3.7, 3.9, 4.1, 4.5. 18 and 19, they did not do the survey. 2020, 5.6, and then see the steep graph go upward to 2021, all the way to 7.1%. Now, why is that happening? Why? There's a, by the way, there's a lot of reasons. One of the main reasons is, just in a very number sense, as the older generation dies out, these are in adults, 18 years and up, where these statistics come from. The old, as the older generation dies out, and I'll show you this in a graph in a second, the percentage was lower, and as the newer generation comes along, the percentage is higher than identified by one of those, and so the overall number is going up. Look at the next chart. It'll help you understand it. Look at the bottom. It says traditionalists. Those are people born before 1946, 0.8 of 1% identified in one of those categories. Now, the baby boomers, 1946 to 1964, 2.6% identified as one. Generation X, 1965 to 1980 births, 4.2%. Millennials, those more 1981 to 1996, 10.5% identified in one of those areas. Generation Z, those, those born from 1997 to 2003, the ones that have moved into adulthood, 20.8% are one in five. So they identify with one of those areas. So you see the progression, you see what's happening. Now, what does that tell us? And when I look at that and when I think about it, here's what it says to me. And, and this is the point I want to make is that our kids are under attack. Children are under attack. There is a war on our kids today. And they're, just think about the numbers. It means they are being groomed and educated to buy into these worldviews that teach these lifestyles. It's a form of evangelism. It's what's going on. I will prove it to you anecdotally in a few moments. There are sinister forces at work in our culture. I wanna say again, I'm not picking on anybody because you are loved here, but I'm picking on the culture that's forcing this on people. Two different things completely. So I wanna, I'm gonna say that over and over today. If you're struggling in one of these areas, you are loved. And we are here to love on you and uh, show you God's truth and show you who you are in Christ Jesus. But there are forces behind this, and we talked about it last week. They're out to destroy the family, to do away with the family and the state. They, they feel like the state needs to raise our kids and not us. And we talked about expressive individualism, that worldview that says you are who you think you are, and whoever you think you are, you should live that out if you're going to be authentic. That's your authentic life, and so you live it out, and I can live whatever life I want, 
and you can't tell me I shouldn't. And, if, and if furthermore, if you have these traditional values, our culture's being taught they need to be done away with completely because they're no longer relevant. And as kids search for answers, that, that survey done by Kara Powell, where she interviewed 2,200 high school students, what they said they're looking for, they're looking for who they really are, they're looking for their identity, who am I? And, and they're looking for a belonging, where do I fit in? Where do I belong as a teenager in this world? And they're asking, can I make a difference? Where do I make a difference? What's my purpose in life? And they're being told to look inside of themselves for the answer to these questions. Do you see the glaring error that is involved in that kind of thinking? Now, our kids are under attack. I'm going to mention five areas real quick, real, just quickly, where our kids are under attack. I'm going to talk about that, and then we're going to look at Scripture and see what Scripture says, the kind of homes, parents, that we're to be raising our kids in to help them deal with these kind of issues. First, first area of attack, I would say, is the area of education. Our schools are a battleground, whether you realize it or not. And I know you've, most of you have heard about this, but our schools are a battleground. There's unbelievable pressure on our kids in all sorts of ways. I'm going to mention just one of the areas, but there are many others. It goes through all the curriculum and all the teaching in many, many places. And, and I will say up front, our school districts are better than most. I will give you that, grant you that. Uh, I want to talk just for a second about the area of sex education in general. Our, our school districts around us allow parents to opt out of the sex ed if they want to. You know, there's a lot of school districts in our country that don't allow that. Ours do allow it. I think primarily, mostly the sex education that's provided, a, a lot of it's okay, not all of it. Do you, know, do you know who claims to be the number one provider of sex education material in our country today? Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood says they write more sex education material used in public schools than any other entity in our country. That's scary. Now, I, I'm not aware of any school in our area that uses that, but that's a scary thought just to think that. But here's my question to you as a parent. Do you know what sex education material is used in your kids' schools? Do you know what it is? If someone asks you right now, what is it? Could you tell them? If not, why not? Because parents, that's your job to know that. And grandparents, I would say it's your job to know it too. That's the reality. I talked to one of our pastors this week who had a son last year in, in school and he, he got a copy of the sex education material that was gonna be taught to him and he chose the opt-out and he took his son out of school and he taught his son that day instead of letting the school teach his son that day. That's a very, very wise thing to do. So we need to be familiar with these kind of things but the education system in general, by the way, we have some wonderful people in our church family involved in public education, godly people people on school boards, people in administration, people that teach, and I thank God for you. It is a tough place to be. And you pray for our educators in all these positions that they'll be strong to stand against the current of the day. <coughs> but education is a place where kids are attacked. Second place is government. The laws being passed today are not for kids. They're not for family. We talked about the one last week the so-called Respect for Marriage Act. There's nothing about Respect for Marriage Act. And, and these, all these other laws that are being passed in states all over the country against kids forcing this. Many, I mentioned a moment ago, many of, these, many of these schools don't allow an opt-out of some of these things that are just gross things being taught to our, our students. Third area of attack is media. You know the story of Disney and the stuff they're requiring of their movies now and, and their shows of X number of people to meet certain requirements and all this stuff. But more than that, more than just Disney, it's, it's, throughout our, it's throughout all of our media. But to me, in parents, if you're not aware of this, you need to know it. The number one area where our kids are being indoctrinated, I think, is just their cell phones they carry around. So much stuff on their cell phones. I, 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 let me just make the point this way. I, I can't talk to moms. I don't know, moms, what you feel or what you experienced growing up. But I can talk to dads. If I think back, and when I was going through puberty as a young kid a zillion years ago, had I had a cell phone and the stuff that's available on the cell phone, it would have marred me for life. I was not emotionally ready for the stuff that's available on cell phones today when I was a kid growing up. I was not. And many, our kids aren't either. They're no different. And they're, they're having this stuff pushed on them and hoisted at them constantly, and it is an attack on our kids. The fourth area is business. Even business is after our kids. You say, really, business? Yeah, let me give you one example. 
There's a book written by Ryan Anderson. The title of the book is When Harry Became Sally. Now, some of you remember the movie When Harry Met Sally. I think it was in the late 80s. Ryan Anderson wrote a book called When Harry Became Sally, and he deals with some of the issues that people that go through uh, gender reassignment experience. And he has honest assessments of what really happens. You know what's happened to his book, which was a very popular book? Amazon canceled it. Amazon would not sell his book because of the pressure brought on them. Brought on them. Now listen, you can go to Amazon and you can read Hitler and you can read Stalin and you can read Ted Szczynski, the, the Unabomber, but you can't read Ryan Anderson and when Harry became Sally, why? Because people don't want you to hear the truth about what happens when people go through some of this stuff. There's a war on our kids, the fifth area, and this, one, this one's a scary area, but medicine is being politicized. Many of you saw the videos from Vanderbilt University Hospital a few weeks ago and what, what came out, what someone found, and what they're talking about, the transgender surgery that they're doing in their hospital. But I want to tell you an incident that I know of personally. There was a doctor named Dr. Mike Miller. He was a member. He and his wife, Debbie, were members of Second Baptist Church at our Woodway campus a number of years ago. In fact, I taught a class with his wife, Debbie, a long time ago. Godly man, wonderful doctor. He is a reconstructive physician. He does reconstructive surgery, and he worked at MD Anderson where he did reconstructive surgery on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of patients who had cancer surgery. A major university hired him away a number of years ago, and they left Houston, and he was the director of this, of this department of reconstructive surgery at this, if I told you the university, you would know it right away, very prestigious university where he directed the surgery, reconstructive surgery for their hospital system. Recently, that university went through, or the, the university hospital went through a leadership change, and they decided to start doing trans, transgender reassignment surgery, and they called Dr. Miller in, and they told him they were gonna do this, and he said, I'm the head of this department, and my department's not gonna be a part of this. And he's no longer the director of medicine for that reconstructive surgery for that hospital system anymore because of the stand he took. Medicine is being politicized. Even medicine is attacking our kids when you look at it in these perspectives. You know, in, in the Gallup poll, that same Gallup poll shows that 0.7% or less than 1% of people say they deal with the transgender issue, but the lobby is so powerful that um, it's causing changes in many, many areas. Now, let me tell you what the people that push this on our kids are actually saying. What this worldview says to people is this, and I'm gonna say this just as simply as I can say it. I don't wanna use any big terms or anything else. <clears throat> but what they say is, and I've already mentioned this, kids, you are what you feel you are. Not just kids, by the way, adults too. They say you are what you feel you are, regardless of your God-assigned sex, how God made you. If you feel like you're a man, you're a man. If you feel like you're a woman, you're a woman. That is who you are. And so they say, this is how you deal with the issue. If you feel this way, you don't change how you feel. You change your body to match your feelings. That's what they're saying to them. Listen, if you start with the wrong premise, you'll end up in the same wrong place every time. And, and that's the picture of what's happening. You know the reality, the statistics say, and a very, very high percentage of young people, teenagers, that have these feelings of, of gender being confused and a very, very high percentage with just a little bit of encouragement, almost every one of them grow out of that in a relatively short period of time. That's what the statistics say. But in some places in the country, kids are being encouraged to go through with hormonal treatments and even surgery that'll change them forever as young people because of their feelings, because of their emotions. Do you see the foolishness in that? Do you see how scary that is? And people say that's being loving and kind to treat them that way. No, it's not. It's being abusive to treat them that way. Because feelings change because how we think about things change. <clears throat> now, I'll, I'll, I say this for the benefit of our students, but for all of us. This happened yesterday. Our, our neighborhood, I don't know about your neighborhood, but our neighborhood has once a year, they have a garage sale once a year. Well, that's like Christmas to Josie, my wife Josie, you know, the garage sale. And so Josie took off yesterday morning and, and she goes out to the garage sale. Well, she met a man in our neighborhood that's fairly new to our neighborhood and started talking to him. 
And she asked him where, her, where they were from, and he told her, and why, are, why did you move here? They, and they were from the Pacific Northwest. I won't tell you the city. They're from a town in the Pacific Northwest. And he has a teenage daughter. He said, the reason we moved here, a young teenage daughter, he said, we moved here because she was in a group of five kids in the town where we lived. And of the five kids, four of the girls decided they were going to identify with one of the LGBTQ plus community areas. Now, how, how did this happen? He said, he said, what happened was when COVID hit and all the kids got restricted to home, they began to spend their lives on their phones. And they began to look at their phones day in and day out and watching the different things on TikTok of the different places. And before long, four of the five decided that they needed to identify with one of these areas. And they said to, to the, his daughter, which one do you identify with? And she said, none of them. And, and she was ostracized because of the pressure of the culture. D do you see that kids are being groomed and educated and pushed into this? that left alone, they wouldn't be feeling like this, they wouldn't be having these kind of emotions for the most part. Not, and by the way, I'm not discounting the issues that kids are dealing with, there are real issues, and so we wanna love kids where they are and help kids from where they are. But you need to hear that. And also I would, say, I would say to you, if you're a teenager or an adult dealing with this, the culture wants to say the church hates you and doesn't like you, they disagree with you. Disagreement doesn't mean we don't love you. My wife and I disagree all the time, but we love each other madly. We disagree a lot. We can disagree and still love each other. You are loved and you are welcome here and we believe you'll find your true identity in Christ in this place. I'm not attacking people dealing with the issue. I'm attacking the culture that let it happen and the adults that were blind and closed their eyes and lazy and gave in to a system and a very small percentage of people that let it happen where our kids are being attacked the way they're being attacked today and they don't even know what's really going on. If you want some resources, by the way, to help you with some of this, I will point you to, a, to an organization called Family Research Council. They produce some great stuff. You can go online and find them. There's some great statistics and great articles there that'll be helpful. Now, I wanna shift gears and spend the rest of our time in our next, last few minutes talking about what God's word says to us. Here's what God's word says to us as parents. We want, think about all these children that were here today. How do we build into their lives the stuff so they don't have fertile ground to take in the stuff the world is trying to tell them is true when it's not true at all? How do we build that into them? In Deuteronomy 6, first three verses, Moses tells Israel, these things that God has for you, these things I'm teaching you, when you move, he's talking about when you go into the promised land, when you go into the promised land, you teach them these things so that your sons and your grandsons, in other words, your kids, and the next generation of kids, your grandkids, and the next generation of kids will know the truth and walk in the truth. So this is about teaching God's truth and walking in God's truth. This is not a quick fix. This isn't five easy steps to have a sweet kid. That's not what this is. But listen to what it says. Here's the first truth. God's truth must be a thing of your heart. God's truth has to be a thing of your heart. Listen to it in verse four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. Now, these are the verses Jesus quoted when he was asked, what's, what's the greatest commandment? And so Moses is summarizing all the truth he's given them. And, and let me give you a couple of principles from this. Here's the first one. Revelation always demands a response. When God reveals something to you, God reveals something to me, it demands a response from us. God says this, he reveals this, and he demands that we do something in response. And in this case, he says, our response must be a response of love. He says in verse five, with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. And we talked about this last week, with all of our intellect, with all of our emotions, with all of our will, we're to love him. And then secondly, this, this is really important, Parents, listen, relationships, a relationship always determines reality. Relationship always determines reality. Now, now what do I mean by that? Look, look in verse six, he says, these words shall be on your heart. What that means is when you're talking about the truth, it means you don't hear the truth and go, oh, I get it. I, I say something from God's truth and you go, oh, I get it. Or your Bible study teacher says something, oh, I get it, no. No, just the opposite. You hear the truth and the truth gets you. You don't get it, it gets you. 
The truth gets on your heart and changes you and changes me. That's what it means for it to be on our heart. Relationship determines reality. Let me illustrate this. You, you go out, if you, if you play, I know some of you this will be boring, but you go out and you play golf, you play, you, you play with three guys you don't know, and you're a decent player, and you start playing, and one of them's really bad. He shoots like 55 on the front nine, and if you play golf, you shoot 55. That's not particularly good. If you play golf and shoot 55, I'm sorry, but you're not good. You might love joy, that's good, keep playing, but you're not good. Anyway, so he shoots 55, and this guy's a good player, and he's playing with him, and you get to the 10th, 11th hole, and the guy that shoots 55 starts telling you how to play. Well, you're not holding the club right. You're not turning, your backswing's all messed up. You're, not ta you're taking the club back, and he starts telling you how to play. Are you gonna listen to him? No, he may, he may have some facts about golf, but the facts don't have him. Okay, parents. You try to teach your kids the truth of God's word and you have the facts, but the facts don't have you. There's a good chance it's gonna fall on deaf ears too. See, the facts have to have us. We communicate the reality of what it means to live with Jesus and walk with him by how we live more than just our words alone. This is caught. It, much of what our kids get from us is, is they take it in unconsciously. They don't even realize it's happening. God's building stuff into them just by observing and seeing what happens in the home. You cannot impart what you do not possess, mom and dad. So it means we, begin, we need to begin by asking the Holy Spirit to take God's truth and put it on our heart, make it a thing of our heart so we live it out in the home. Here's the second point. God's truth must be a thing of the home. It's to be a thing of the heart. It's to be a thing of the home. Verse seven says, you shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. If God's truth is not a thing of our heart, it will not be a thing of our home. The home is where the heart is revealed. I can fool you. I, I can stand up and preach and fool you to think I've got it all together and your Bible study teacher can stand up and fool you to think they have it all together. But you know who I can't fool? You know who they can't fool? Who none of us can fool? Our family. Because in the home is where the heart is really revealed. I can't fool my wife, I can't fool my kids, and neither can, neither can you. He says, he says in verse seven there, teach, teach them. Have a plan to teach your kids. The, one of the things I would say to you is, is, and Josie did a way better job of this than I did, but have a, make, make your dinner time at home. Make it a priority to spend time with your family at dinner each night. What a great time to teach your kids. That's the picture. Make it a priority to teach them the things they need to know. And someday when your kids come to you and ask you, why do you give to the church? Why do you give to the cause of Christ? Why do you walk with God? You really need to have an answer for them when they ask you those things. Moms and dads, we need to have an answer for them. Verse 20 of the same chapter, it says, when your sons ask you in time to come saying, what do the testimonies and statutes and the judgments mean which the Lord our God commanded you? Then you shall say to them, go ask your mother doesn't say that. You're supposed to have an answer for them, to be able to talk to them, to give them an answer for why you believe what you believe. And then he says to talk. Now, notice this is not the talk, but it's many talks. It's an as-you-go kind of talk. It's spontaneous. It's non-structured. This is where kids soak up the truth. It, it says when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. All of life, all through life. Let me give you a modern translation of this. When you drive carpool, talk to your kids. When you drive carpool, listen to your kids. Take your neighbor's kids with you. Get to know them. Pour into their life a little bit. Listen to them. When you do these things, when you're at home, I don't know about now, but when our kids are growing up, one of the most stressful times of the day was homework time. And when the kids were in the den doing homework, it was stressful. What a great time to listen and to talk and to teach. When your kids have relationship problems at school with a friend or whatever, what a great time to teach them and to teach them to love other people and to care as much of others as they do themselves and to show grace and mercy to people. When you put your kids in bed at night, I've, of all the things I miss about our kids and being home when they were little was the time to put them down at night to read a Bible story and to pray with them. And I don't miss the games. I don't miss the running around. I don't miss any of that. I miss those moments like that. 
of being able to pour into them like that. And that kind of setting, that kind of talking is where real truth is exchanged and kids are learning, they're growing. These are God-ordained classes, if you will, for the family. It's like a university that God's designed that's better than any other university ever designed. One, one more thought on this. Um, dads are probably more guilty of this than moms, but it's true for all of us. Dads don't run from those awkward moments. Moms don't, don't run from those awkward moments of discussions with your kids. There are some awkward conversations that happen. It's not the time to run from those. Your kids need to have those conversations with you. They're going to have them with somebody better with you. One of the thoughts is, some of you won't remember this, the students won't remember these times, but a lot of us will. The radio used to be, when you, when you tuned in the radio, you used to have to turn the dial, remember, some of you? And you'd have to turn the dial and get it in just the right place to hear the radio station. That's the idea of what we need to do with our kids. We turn the dial and we tune in to our kids to really hear them. And that means Howard Hendricks used to always say, and he so impacts all the things I'm saying to you this morning, the things I learned from him. But, but he always said, listen more and lecture less. I can hear our kids thinking in their mind, amen to that one. Listen more and lecture less. Here's the third point. God's truth must be a thing of the habit. You shall bind them on, as a sign on your hand and they shall... Be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So you see the connection? If God's truth is a thing of your heart, and then it can be a thing of your home, and if it's a thing of your home, then it's to be a thing of your habit. The home is where the habit patterns of your children will ultimately be developed. Now, it's interesting that the, the Jews kind of misunderstood this, and they went through all the motions of this, and they had their phylacteries and stuff where the word was there and everything. But if it was just a ritual, that's really missing the point of this. God was saying, put, put the truth on your hand because it's to control everything you do. Put the truth on your forehead because it's to control how you think and what your attitudes are. Put, put it on the doorpost of your home because the truth is to control the most intimate parts of your life. Put it on the gates because it's to control your business and your community relationships and all those things. In other words, we have the truth in front of us because it's to permeate every area of our lives. That's the picture. And that's the goal for our kids. Now, can you see this? Can you see the picture that God has given us? To have a home where a mother and a father in a loving relationship love their kids and build this stuff into their lives. God's truth must be a thing of the heart, must be a thing of the home must be a thing of the habit. And then it's poured into the life of the child. Now, I, I understand in our culture, we, we've missed this almost, and we've all missed it. None of us get this all right. You understand that, I understand that. But this is what God calls us to. This is what God would encourage us to live out. It doesn't mean God can't take a kid that doesn't have this environment and make this kid a wonderful kid. God does it all the time. And so I would say to our students, if you don't come out of this kind of home, man, you'd be here and you'd be here hearing our student pastors pour into your life because they love you and they will give you the truth from God's word. And that's so good. And so I encourage you to do that. But to parents, let me say this, just some practical stuff in closing. Number one, parents, check your attitude. Do you live life with a bitter attitude, just kind of, sour at the world all the time. That comes across to your kids. They just pick up on it if that's it. If you're in a habit of complaining about teachers and preachers and youth pastors and everybody else in your kid's life, they won't have an impact on your kid's life. Secondly, um, I know you love your family. Do you communicate your love to them? How do you communicate your love to them? I would start, by the way, with that idea of listening more really listen to, when you listen to someone, when you really listen to them and hear their heart and what they're struggling with and why they're struggling with it and the kind of pressures they're facing, and kids are facing unbelievable pressures today to conform to what culture tells them is the truth. Listen to them, it lets them know that you really love them. And this next one is, is really important and it sounds so simple, 
but it's so winsome. But enjoy your family. Enjoy them. Have fun with them. Make your home a place where your kids want to be and your kids' friends want to be because you enjoy their presence, you enjoy their company. They know, they pick up on that. The last thing I'd say to parents is this, and I think parents are guilty of this. Don't discount the value of your relationship with your child. Your relationship with your child is more important than any other earthly relationship in their life. More than their friends, believe it or not, more than their friends, it should be more than their phones, more than their teachers, even more than their youth pastors, as much as I want the kids here all the time. But God has ordained it so that you have the most impact on your kids. So don't discount that. God calls you to be that person in their life. So you see the picture? Can you see? I know it, I know it sounds so idealistic and none of us get it all right, but can you see it? Can you see how the home is to be where God's truth is on our heart that it has us and affects the way we live. And because it's on our heart, then it's in our homes. And because it's in our homes, then our kids catch it. And it becomes a part of who they are and the habit of their life. It ends up in their home at some point and prayerfully in the home of their children after them. That's the way God designed it. And that's what God calls us to. So let me just try to kind of wrap it up with our sin, if I can, to, our, to anyone in the room, any of you, students, young people, kids, adults, if you're dealing with any of these issues, I want you to know culture has lied to you and the church does not hate you, the church loves you and cares for you, we care about you. And we want you to know you can find real identity in Christ. That's where you find real identity. To the church, to our parents, we need to live this out. We need to make our home so attractive that our kids say, that's the kind of life I want. I want that kind of joy. I want that kind of purpose. I want that kind of identity in my life. And, and, to, and to us as a church, I'd also say it's time that we stand up and push back against that culture that's doing this to our kids. Woe to those through whom this stumbling block comes. We can't allow this stumbling block to continue to do what it does to our world. It's our job to stand up and push back and not be afraid of what the world says. We love people. We live out that love in our homes and we stand up and we push back against the culture that's destroying the lives of so many kids. May God give us the grace and the courage to stand and be the men and the women that he's called us to be for his glory.